Welcome to the Clinical Cousins YouTube channel. This video is going to be on DIC. Uh, what's DIC? Well, it's an acronym for Disseminated Intervascular Coagulation. So disseminated just means throughout intervascular or inside the vasculature where the blood's contained, coagulation or forming clots. So why in this condition is a hallmark sign of it bleeding from every orifice, every cut, every scratch, and every surgical wound? Well, to, to understand that, we're gonna to have to understand a little bit about how clots are formed in the first place, but it does start off as a thrombotic condition first, which leads to hemorrhage. That's why it's categorized as a thrombohemorrhagic syndrome. Uh, it's also categorized as a consumptive coagulopathy because it consumes your platelets, it consumes all of your clotting factors. So how does your body work? Your body lives in a balance between coagulation and bleeding, and it does this for a good reason. If I were to draw blood here or I had an injury uh, outside of the endothelial wall where the blood runs is collagen and in that collagen is tissue factor. Uh, this tissue factor activates clot formation. So when your blood has tissue factor in it, it goes, I need to go ahead and form a clot. So it does that so you don't bleed to death. So if this, uh, if let's say I did a puncture here for an ABG, I drew blood and now this hole is left open in the endothelial wall and blood could spill out. But because there's tissue factor there, it tells me I need to go ahead and form a clot here. But if I kept clotting, I would obstruct that whole capillary or vessel or artery. So I need it only to a degree, but not so much that my whole blood turns into jello or gel. So because of that, as soon as a clot starts to form, my body immediately starts to also break it down. And a process of a uh, thrombolytic process also begins. And as this thrombolytic process begins, it starts breaking up the clot and releasing little products we call uh, fibrin end products or fibrin split products, which is like one we call D-dimer. So when we see D-dimer in the blood, we say, well, there's probably a clot somewhere that's being broken down uh, because as soon as they're formed, they start breaking down. That keeps them from occluding the whole, uh, the vessel off, hopefully. So uh, it also has the clot's usefulness and the, the vessel wall sort of is healed. Uh, you know, that that's completely dissolved out. So that's why we look for those. So what happens in DIC is we have this process go on, which is good, but it goes on in excess till we use up all of our clotting factors, all of our platelets, and we have none left. So what type of things could cause this process to use all of our supply? Because this is made in the liver, uh, your clotting factors, and if you use more than the supply that's out there, much like your red blood cells only, they take about seven days to mature in the bone marrow and then they're only floating around 120 days, you have a limited supply of these. So if you use all the supply, if the demand goes too high, uh, you end up in a deficit or you don't have enough. So now you go from clot formation to hemorrhaging because now every little nick you have, old surgical wounds, all those things have no way to maintain clot formation, so they're only breaking clots down or degrading clots or degrading fibrin uh, and forcing you into a state of bleeding. So what things could cause that? Well, massive trauma, massive crush injury can release a lot of tissue factor with that collagen. Amniotic fluid embolism, you have somebody post uh, partum suddenly get short of breath or get hypotensive, they're having an anaphylactic like reaction. You manage it and then all of a sudden they start bleeding out of every orifice, they start uh, bleeding from every scratch, every surgical wound starts bleeding. What's happened? Well, DIC. DIC is always secondary to something else. So massive trauma burns uh, pancreatitis. A lot of times the enzymes that the pancreas release can start causing a necrotizing condition. That can end up lending itself to DIC. Solid tumors uh, and sepsis through tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6 can actually cause people to go into DIC. So when you go into DIC, you form all these microclots. Well, these microclots can clog up a lot of your very distal circulation. So it, they can cause something called microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So as it goes down through the little vessels, it ends up clogging up at the distal tips where they're the smallest. And as red blood cells try to pass through there, these cross-linked fibrin meshes, it'll start slicing those red cells in half. So what happens is a sliced and half red blood cell is useless for oxygen carrying. So it's what we call schistocyte. So if you get a peripheral smear, uh, the doctor may order that or provider, they, it may say helmet cells or schistocytes. Well, that lets you know that you have a hemolytic anemia going on, specifically in this one, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. The other thing is these little clots, uh, they like to go out to uh, the microcirculation there. 
your kidneys get a lot of your cardiac output in order to filter your blood. So they're a great place for those uh, little clots to get wedged in. So you can end up in a renal failure with that as well. Due to the fact you consume all of your clotting factors eventually with the uh, DIC, you lose all your fibrinogen. So on your labs, it, it'll say fibrinogen will be low uh, because you've ran out of it. You've used it all up to make clots and now you're breaking those uh, uh, down. Other thing is, is you need these pathways to uh, reduce your PT, PTT times. So you'll notice you'll have really high PT, PTT uh, times. Uh, the other things are bleeding times. You'll notice that your bleeding times are severely elevated because you've consumed and used all of your platelets. So DIC is a secondary process. How will, how will it be managed? Well, DIC will be managed by managing what primarily caused it. What caused it? Was it sepsis? And we need to manage sepsis. Was it amniotic fluid embolism? We need to stabilize those patients because in amniotic fluid embolism or retained products of conception, the main killer isn't the embolism itself, it's DIC. So uh, we need to make sure if they go into DIC, we treat it, but we manage uh, the primary cause first. Trauma, we need to manage those crush wounds. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna do is because we're out of these clotting factors, we're gonna need to replace those. So fresh frozen plasma has these in them, but cryoprecipitate, think of it like concentrated FFP so we can get more of these clotting factors, specifically fibrinogen. We need to support clot formation because our, we do, don't want our patients bleeding to death and exsanguinating and dying. So we need to support the, the clotting process. Now, used to they would do heparin because uh, technically if you could stop thrombin, you could stop the clot formation. And then if you could stop it, you could stop using all this process up and, and going into hemorrhagic syndrome. But no one comes to the hospital uh, healthy. So by the time, uh, most of the time our providers are managing them, uh, they're already too far in this process and this, uh, they're saying now can cause more harm than good. So a lot of times we're trying to keep fibrinogen levels up greater than 150. Uh, and in pregnant la uh, uh, ladies, we're trying to keep it greater than 200. So this is our video on DIC. We're going to do a video on TTP next because it can sometimes mimic this other than it doesn't have a primary cause. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe here and stay tuned for our TTP video, which will be a little shorter, and then our DASC versus TTP video, which will be after that.